you're a Londoner, how far do you think you live from a convicted child molester? She's up on fire for me! Is it, mate? If the council's up there, they know who they are! Tell us! It's not one mile. We just want to know who they are so we can protect our children. It's not even half a mile. How can we see what they're doing if we don't even know who they are? Tell us who they are. Mm. In fact, on average, every Londoner lives within 200 yards of a proven paedophile. Tonight, the London program asks, should we be told about the monsters in our midst? Do you intend to abuse more children, Mr. Pedman? A windy Friday night in Dagenham, Essex. People are arriving at a working men's club for a meeting organized by residents on the nearby Ryland estate. Inside, a 200-strong audience has gathered. What I was hoping I'd find out is that perhaps where the paedophiles did live, not to be a vigilante as some of these people think, but to, to make my children aware, and my wife and anybody else that I could tell, where these paedophiles live. I don't particularly want to kill them, I don't like what they've done, but at the end of the day, if I can guard them from it, that's what I want to do. Passions are running high over news that a convicted child sex offender is regularly visiting the estate. I'm a mother of seven small children. The eldest of mine is ten, which play out in the streets all the time. And if I was to know who this person was, I could keep an eye on the children, but they're not prepared to tell us. The main focus of parents' concern is a former teacher called John Eames. He was released from prison last November after serving three years of a five-year sentence for sexually assaulting three five-year-old girls. It was five years ago in a Hackney primary school that 48-year-old Eames carried out the attacks. He just told us to call him Mr Bean. He's got funny ears. He's got a nose like Mr Bean. On two occasions, Eames took the girls into a classroom cupboard and locked the door before abusing them. He took us in the cupboard and um, he laid on top of me and um, he made <laughs> lick his wood and that's all I can remember. Did you tell your mum and dad when it happened? Because he said if I tell my mum and dad, um, um, the police will take him away and I'll never see him again. Did that frighten you? Yeah. Rachel's parents learnt about the abuse after their eldest daughter was told by a classmate who had witnessed it. I couldn't take it all in at first. Um, it took... It took all day, all night, perhaps the next day, to really sink in. And it took a long time for to come out with a, a lot of things. And since the court case, she's come out with even more. It's very painful for us to listen. Um, she's been through an awful lot. He's put her through hell. Has he hurt you? Has he hurt you a lot? What's this guy doing in a job like a being a teacher? Um, what's Hackney Education thinking about employing these sort of people? On the day Eames was freed on probation, a warning notice was anonymously distributed in Dagenham, his hometown. Since his release, it's his visits to his mother-in-law's home on the Ryland estate that are causing most concern. At the public meeting, residents want to know the address of Eames and other sex offenders they've been told are on the estate. I yeah, but ain't these people entitled to know? We know about one on our estate, but we've also been told that there's more than one and we don't know who they are. Surely a campaign like this, if we can find out who the others are... Well, who's there, Sally? Yeah. It's not the council up there! We don't know who they are. We, we don't know where they are. They may not even been convicted for anything. They may have just been... We don't want vigilantes! We just want to know! That's all! Yes, that's what we're trying to do! Well, so there's the council you know, so you up there! Choose you don't want to fight in these houses, isn't they? If the council's up there, they know who they are! Tell us! Who 
how do you feel about being the subject of such a compassionate community outburst? I feel devastated. I think anybody would. I would say to a worried parent, particularly those in this street, is come and talk to me. For Christ's sake, come and talk, because you do not know anything about me, you do not know anything about my case, you do not know a thing of what happened. All you know is what you read in a newspaper. And the newspapers are written in such a way as to make me out to be the most vilest pervert in the Northern Hemisphere, practically. As well as being jailed for sexually abusing three pupils, Eames has a conviction for indecent exposure. He's also been the subject of a string of complaints by other schools in Hackney, including allegations of physical and sexual assaults against children. Yet Eames, who agreed to talk to us on condition we didn't show his face, denies he's a paedophile. Why did you commit such appalling acts of indecency against these children? I did not children. sexually violate these yeah, young yeah, children. There was not an overwhelming amount of evidence. All they had as evidence was what the children said. That was it. There was no physical evidence, there was no medical evidence, there, there was, was no right forensic right. evidence, so there, there was nothing. In fact, his three victims and an older eyewitness all gave evidence against him in court. He knows he's not innocent. We know it. He knows he's guilty, we know it, the police know it, the, most of all, the children know it. And what he's done, he should be remorseful for. He's so, so devious. And what worries me, honestly, is that it will happen again. I know it will, with him. According to the Home Office, there are more than 100,000 convicted paedophiles living in England and Wales. At least 15,000 of them are in the capital. That means that, on average, every Londoner lives no more than 200 yards from a proven child sex offender. It's figures like these that have fueled the growing public clamour for the right to know who these paedophiles are and where they are. Campaigns to out child sex offenders have been gathering momentum in recent months. I think this emergence of campaigns all over the country to have community notification if a paedophile lives in their area is because people are frustrated. The law is not protecting children. Offenders are getting out, they're reoffending. kids are vulnerable, and nobody seems to be able to do anything about it. So parents are scared. One major concern is that paedophiles will succeed in abusing children no matter what. Indeed, research suggests a recidivism rate of up to 40%. I don't know how many children I've abused because it's, uh, there's been so many. It's, uh, you don't keep count, you forget most of them, and uh, it's just one after another. It's, uh, hundreds? Over the years, yes. It's been in the hundreds. 51-year-old John Bridgehouse has been abusing children for 30 years, but only has three convictions. He's now had treatment and says he hasn't re-offended for four years. The abuse was uh, touching the children. And encouraging the children to touch myself. It's a compulsion. You, you've got to do it. You have no other feelings in your mind. There's nothing else exists. The world stops and it's all disappeared. It's just you and that child. You and that little body. And uh, you don't... You, you're, like, you're just like a mad dog. You've got to do it. You've got to have satis sexual satisfaction. You've got to get it there and then. It has to be achieved. The fixated paedophile who has a belief system that it's not wrong to abuse, that the age of consent is wrong, and that children do give consent, some of those men can abuse easily 50 to 200 children in their lifetime, maybe even more. Um, and there is no reason why they are going to stop. Tragically, most of those men get away with it anyway. We don't catch them. But those we do catch, um, if you put them in prison and do nothing with them, there is no reason at all why they are going to stop abusing when they come back out. Belmarsh Prison in south-east London houses some of the capital's most notorious child sex offenders. Among them is 25-year-old Mark Weaver, who has a string of convictions for abusing young boys. This is an artist's impression of him. 
I met Mark Weaver in 1991, um, big Christmas time, just before Christmas. I didn't know nothing about him, nothing about his past. If I'd have known anything about his past, then there'd have been no way he'd have been allowed to go anywhere near my children. Weaver became friends with Janet's brother and took a keen interest in her two sons. My two boys were six and ten year old and he kept putting on his knee, lending him nursery rhymes and singing to him, being friendly and singing um, This Little Piggy Went to Market. We started putting his hands down our pants and then carrying on singing it. Before we come out of the room, he said, don't tell no one. So then we went out of the room, just went upstairs and told my mum. I just couldn't take it in. I couldn't take it in at all what had happened. Police came, they took a statement, they took Weaver away, they gave him bail. I found out a couple of days later that he got bail. So I went round to Weaver's house and he answered the door to me. So I kicked ten colours out of him. And his, his dad had to come to the door and grab him away. I said I killed him. I'd put his head straight through a glass panel. After Weaver's arrest, Janet discovered that he'd helped her brother babysit the children several years before. Weaver told police he had abused her younger son when he was just two. I found out that he'd had anal sex with him when I was two and a half. And he's gonna die for it. But he never got charged for it. He's got to die for this. He can't live for what he's done. What went through your, your mind when you were first told that? It. it is the little boy going to die? Janet sent her child for an HIV test, which thankfully proved negative. In March 1993, at Bolton Crown Court, Weaver admitted three offences of indecent assault and was given a six-year jail term. But a charge of buggery was dropped because of concerns the judge had over Weaver's confession to police. In court, Weaver's criminal past was revealed. In October 1987, when he was 15, he was put under supervision for two years after taking a boy to a railway embankment and abusing him. He pulled the child's pants down and punched him in the stomach before molesting him. The boy was five years old. In December 1988, he was placed on probation for two years after masturbating a six-year-old boy. A year later, he was convicted of abusing another child in his bedroom. This time, his victim was just three years of age. Weaver was sentenced to five years. His latest offences were committed only two weeks after he had been released from prison. The London programme learned about Weaver through a source inside one of the agencies reviewing his probation. They told us that he was due for release from Belmarsh Prison in South East London. The source was worried about what he might do once he was free. When we investigated further, we obtained this confidential report. It reveals disturbing details of Weaver's behaviour in prison and demonstrates graphically why the authorities are so concerned about the prospect of his release. The report was written by the Inner London Probation Service after a meeting with prison officials, police and social services. Over a period of time, he's become more calculating, malicious and increasingly institutionalised. And because by his own admission, he's likely to commit further serious offences on release, concerns are becoming more acute. Attempts to address his offending whilst in prison at HMP Albany, Isle of Wight, have not proved positive. His behaviour was extremely disruptive and he was subsequently transferred to HMP Belmarsh, 
where he has made links with sex offenders and paedophiles. The report was written last January, with his release scheduled for February the 28th. We'll be returning to Weaver later in the programme. With the general election only weeks away, public concern about persistent offenders like Weaver has not been lost on the politicians. In recent months, the government has introduced a series of measures designed to tackle sex crimes, including DNA testing and mandatory life sentences for a second serious offence. But it's the setting up of a police register of convicted sex offenders which is seen as the central plank in the government's war against paedophiles. It's, uh, it's going to be a register which is kept the details of the names and the current addresses of those who've actually been convicted and have uh, come out of uh, custody uh, for a range of sexual offences, particularly sexual offences uh, against children. If they have this information, and it is in the main up to date about those who have a history of uh, sex offending, then that will help the police enormously and cut down the amount of uh, work that they have to do otherwise when such cases have to be investigated. But many feel a police register will not stop determined paedophiles. We mustn't imagine that the register is the be all and end all of child protection. The fact that we're going to ask people to register or force them to register doesn't mean to say that we're going to diminish the problem but it's an important first step but a lot of these people won't want to register and will resist it and if they resist it then we have to make the sanctions strong enough to ensure that they do they'll, they'll get over, they'll get around it somehow they'll still carry on doing it it won't stop them nothing will stop a beautiful uh, you can sentence them to life imprisonment they don't care because when they're, when they're sexually aroused, nothing else is in their mind. Only those paedophiles currently serving sentences or under supervision will be required to register. There are over 100,000 previously convicted paedophiles who are at large in the community, and 50,000 of those have committed such serious offences that they would still have been required to register under the terms of this bill if the bill was retrospective but it's not retrospective in that way, so nothing's being done to address the issue of keeping track of all those offenders. If the government is saying that, they can't, that the police don't have the resources to deal with child sex offenders in a retroactive way, then they should put the resources in. I mean, what are we saying? We're saying that children are not important enough to protect. We don't want to put money there. You know, we're quite happy to put money into defense and into other things but into our, our, our most vulnerable members of our society, we're not willing to protect them. I think that's very sad. Once they hurt somebody, they have no rights. After the break, one woman who forced a nation to think again about outing sex offenders, and who believes Britain desperately needs to follow suit. I think that um, your country is moving in the direction of, of where we already are uh, with, with this type of legislation. My fear is that they won't move there quickly enough. She's a wonderful little girl. She smiled all the time, had nothing negative in her body. You know, she was an absolute loving little girl. On July the 29th, 1994, Megan Kanker went missing from her home in the quiet suburb of Hamilton Township, New Jersey. Police searched for miles around, but it was eventually discovered that Megan had been raped and strangled in a house across the street. There were many, many people at that time, many people. Uh, not only family, but people came from all over the state. They were all there. And um, I could hear wailing and it was literal wailing I believe it was my mother uh, from the other room and um, no reaction I just couldn't believe that something like that could happen the man charged with the killing was one of their neighbors 33 year old Jesse Tamendaquas unknown to the cankers Tamendaquas had several convictions for sexual offenses against children including strangling another girl he left for dead Tamendaquas shared the house with two other convicted paedophiles. 
I couldn't believe that we had three pedophiles living across the street and we didn't know. You got three child molesters, child sex offenders, living in an area where there's 15 kids under the age of 10 floating around mm -hmm. and playing and riding their bikes. And we just, it was hard to believe that this type of behavior from an adult could be, could go unnoticed to the authorities and to, the, to our community. The day after Megan's body was found, neighbors launched a petition demanding the right to know if any other sex offenders were living in the community. The cankers were told of the campaign and became the driving force to establish what quickly became known as Megan's Law. My daughter lost her rights in the house. And I don't care what person in, in Congress or wherever it is that says that we have to worry about the rights of these people. No, we don't. Once they hurt somebody, they have no rights. Well, if you have a community that is notified that an offender is coming to move in, uh, it's an awareness. What the parent needs to do is they need to realize that uh, by being informed about a, an offender moving into their neighborhood, the information is given to them as a uh, for protection so that they can keep their eyes open, keep watch of their children, and most importantly, educate their children. Senate Bill 14 has received 40 votes in the affirmative, none of them have declared passed, take the usual course of passed votes. Just 89 days after Megan's death, Megan's law was passed by the state of New Jersey. Similar laws were quickly adopted in other states, culminating in President Clinton signing a national version last May. People who commit crimes should be caught, convicted, and punished. Seattle, home to America's longest running notification scheme. People here are told about released sex offenders through leaflets and public meetings. When we started doing community notification, we started holding community meetings in various parts of the city as offenders were being released. Since we've done this for seven years now, we've pretty well covered uh, the entire city several times. It's a good thing because it removes the veil of secrecy that the sex offender uses in order to commit their crimes. An hour's drive from Seattle at Twin Rivers Penitentiary, sex offenders are being briefed about community notification by Detective Schilling. Some are not convinced. Uh, it will make it harder for them to fend into that uh, community, into that area. But who knows if they're going to go into the next county and reoffend where they don't know them, mm -hmm. or go to another state and reoffend where they don't know them, and they don't have the pictures. My planning for an offense can go on for months. Uh, I can wait until the heat around me dies down. Okay, they've probably thrown the pictures away by now. Okay, I've got their trust. Um, gee, they think I'm pretty nice. Hey, it's working well. Bam, I can find a new victim. In North Central Seattle, 42-year-old Paul Teachman is out for a stroll. Six months ago, he was one of the inmates at Twin Rivers Penitentiary. Now, he lives on a suburban street where the neighbors have been told about his crimes. Over the years, I've probably got gained about 30 victims. Uh, their age ranges from two to nine years of age, and they're both boys and girls that I uh, offended against. Uh, groping the children's private parts, uh, dig digitally raping with my fingers, uh, inserting my fingers into the private parts, um, giving them baths, uh, general things like that. Teachman lived with several other former inmates in a house used to reintegrate sex offenders into the community. It's just 50 yards from a children's play area. Before leaving prison, Teachman was frightened by the prospect of having his photograph distributed amongst his neighbors to be. I was definitely worried for my own personal safety. I've heard about offenders that uh, there have been a couple cases where uh, one, one offender lost his house, another offender got beat up. Um, I was quite worried about it. Uh, it concerned me. But after six months without any problems, he's become a supporter of the scheme. It's taken one of the biggest, and I mean the biggest, things I, I have to work with away from me, and that is secrecy. 
people, I mean, being able to hide what I'm doing from people, I can go on for life as long as people don't know about me. The more people don't know about me, the safer I'm, I am to the community. What would be your fears for our country if we were not to see some version of Megan's Law here? Well, you know, I, I think that um, your country is moving in the direction of, of where we already are uh, with, with this type of legislation. My fear is that they won't move there quickly enough because, you know, for the time that you wait, you have more victims. We would get this petition up and we would work with our community. Three and a half thousand miles from Makanka's home, another group of concerned parents believe it's time for a Megan's Law bandwagon in Britain. Tonight, they're spreading the message to the Ryland estate. Why do we have to copy other countries for our government to do something? So now it's down to us, the people. If you're angry, don't take it out on these people. Go and lobby your MPs. Come with us to government. Let's keep on at them. We've got to do something now to protect our children. Because if we don't protect them, nobody else will. Jill Turner is a founder of a group called People Power a grassroots campaign pressing for laws to out paedophiles in Britain. We now feel as parents we do have the right to know what danger exists for our children and we are urging the government to make notification and registration become law. As we feel, had we known who these, these predators are, if we know who they are, then maybe half of these children wouldn't have lost their lives. It's just nine months since People Power launched its campaign. In that time, organizers say that 80,000 people have signed their petition calling for a British version of Meghan's Law. But how many Londoners really do want paedophiles to be outed? What do we want? Charity! What do we, want? we asked more than 300 tenants and residents associations in inner London what sort of community notification, if any, they would support. The results were emphatic. 80% said they were in favor of schools and youth groups being notified while 72% said neighbours living near convicted paedophiles should be told about them. Nearly two-thirds said they thought notification would stop some children from being abused. People power, that's what it is. You, the people. But the greatest obstacle to persuading the government to pass public notification laws may be the public themselves. Because at the end of the day, they want your vote. If somebody assaulted a kid around my way, then I, would, I don't care how far I would have to go to assault that person. Out. That wasn't worrying me, because kids are kids. All community notification does is drive the offender into someone else's community, because notification doesn't make the community vigilant. It makes them vigilantes, and that's the problem. We've already had attacks on the wrong people. We had an elderly man attacked in Manchester who wasn't even an offender. We had tragically a 14-year-old girl killed in Birmingham when the arson attacked the home to kill an offender. But he wasn't there, but the child was. And I can go on and on and on. We cannot and we must not have community notification. It is not about child protection. They'll just drive him away. You know, all he'll do is go somewhere else. Just because he's not to abusing your children doesn't mean to say he won't abuse someone else's. He will. Two years ago, paedophile Jimmy Larwood was released from prison after serving four years for abusing children as young as six. Within weeks of his release, details of how Larwood's home in North Woolwich overlooked a school playground were published in the News of the World. On the day the News of the World published the article, the local community reacted with fury. A group of residents went up to Larwood's flat, smashed down the door, ransacked it, stealing what they could. They then pinned up a copy of the News of the World article on the wall. When Larwood returned to, to his flat, he found a baying mob gathered outside the flats just behind me, many of them shouting abuse. Larwood was obviously petrified and called the police and was removed for his own safety. Larwood has not been back to the estate since and was last known to be living in a safe house in East London. But our survey shows that many people think vigilante attacks on paedophiles are a price worth paying. 
Of those who favoured informing neighbours about the whereabouts of paedophiles, 60% acknowledged that this would lead to attacks on the offenders. Where can we see what they're doing if we don't even know who they are? Tell us who they are, we'll go and fucking find them. Back at the meeting in Dagenham, parents are growing increasingly frustrated. The organisers have decided not to release details of John Eames' whereabouts for fear of reprisals. It's left to people power to try and calm things down. The government want you to be like, how you're reacting tonight is ignorance and being uneducated is exactly what the government want. We want to know where he is, something This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the communities to know we're in the yeah, the lady's telling you it can happen tomorrow. They've got to hurt another kid before the call. Yeah, yeah. So, They've got to hurt some other kid before the call. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. And usually, they, they usually go from over 200 children. Too late, then. We're talking about tomorrow. No, that is not true. That ain't going to happen overnight. That is not true. It's not the church. Number one, you are not going to get anywhere. I ain't saying you are so patronising. Do you know that? Yeah, we know all that, love. You talked about it for the last fucking hour. We're we'll talking about it tomorrow. We care about these children in the whole of this country. Not just in our back garden, in all back gardens. I would be the first to tell a man to admit I would decapitate their head off if I could. That isn't going to get us anywhere. Because at the end of the day, while I'm lying in the jail for 20 years and my children are out here, who is going to be tampering with my children or protecting my children while I'm lying in the cell? It started on the day I arrived back. The car on which I was working was vandalised. Uh, we had to get rid of it in the end. Uh, I've been shouted at in the street, I've been threatened. The reason I think that these attacks have happened is because nobody has handled the situation properly from the beginning. It's just sudden information thrust on you. You know, there's a paedophile next door. Oh, let's all go off and get him. If, on the other hand, those people had had, had the time and, and had had the meetings and had had proper preparation, I don't think the vigilante things would happen. I think that we're much more responsible than the government thinks we are. In the absence of a government policy on public notification, at least 14 police forces have begun distributing information to schools, and in some cases, neighbours, about particular sex offenders. In October last year, a warning went out to all 76 schools in Haringey, North London. A man who was deemed by police to pose a serious threat to children had been seen outside schools in the borough, and had even followed children home. There was information that uh, the man was hanging around outside this school uh, and therefore we, we were particularly concerned in this instance that uh, children would be aware not to go off with anyone answering to his description or of course with anybody at all other than a parent or carer. The warning was about this man, Michael Pedley, a paedophile with a string of sexual offences dating back 18 years. His crimes include five convictions for sexually assaulting children as young as six years old. Police did not issue a photograph of Pedley to schools, but instead gave headteachers a description of him, in which he was said to be dark-skinned. It wasn't until three weeks later that they issued a new notice saying Pedley was in fact white. The present situation is chaotic and unacceptable. There are some police forces that are sharing information with the public and the community about the whereabouts of child sex offenders. But there are other police forces who've been told that they shouldn't do that because they run the risk of being um, sued in the courts. Now, we can't allow that confusion to continue. There has to be some national legal framework uh, which will uh, regulate the disclosure of this information to the public. Why can't we have the right that Americans have to know if there's a child sex offender living in our communities? It's very difficult to see how this would fit in terms of the UK. I mean, it's all very well going to Washington to see how things happen there. And indeed, I go to Washington from time to time, some of my other responsibilities, to see or make comparisons. But what I have said, and, and others, I think, share my concerns about this, is that there is a, a serious risk of vigilantism, which might well defeat the whole benefit that we would get out of this registration arrangement.
With the government having resisted public notification laws, parents are left to worry about the presence of sexual predators in their midst. Michael Pedley moved out of Haringey after being exposed in a national newspaper and disappeared. But the London programme has tracked him down. We found him living in a flat overlooking this primary school in Forest Hill in South London. Over several days, we secretly filmed Pedley up to his old tricks. He always left his home just as children were arriving for morning lessons. Each day, he took the same roundabout route past three schools, often loitering outside the gates. Ironically, his eventual destination was a nearby church. Good morning. My name's Lee Sorrell from London Weekend Television. Um, we'd like to ask you why it is that a man with your record for sexually abusing young boys continues to loiter outside schools and, w and follow boys home. Can you answer why that is? So, uh... well, Mr. Pedley, we've got some questions to ask you. Why is it that you continually loiter outside schools, follow children home, and now, even despite all the concern you've caused parents, teachers and children, you've now got yourself a flat directly opposite another school. Why have you actually done that? Are you aware of the anxiety you're causing? Mr Pedley, we just want to ask you a few questions. Do you intend to abuse more children, Mr Pedley? Mr Pedley, have you got anything to say about the anxiety you're actually no. causing the children? Public notification might make it harder for the likes of Pedley to carry out their activities unmonitored, but it can only go so far. After the break, we look at why notification would have done nothing to save the life of this young boy. From the moment your child is born, he is the most important person in the world. You care for him, you worry for him, you protect him. And after all that concern, isn't he worth just one more thing? A car that is thoughtfully designed to cocoon him safely from the outside world. The Astra from Vauxhall. With Cheltenham and Gloucester mortgages, there are no valuation fees, no mortgage indemnity premiums. They don't insist you buy their buildings and contents insurance. They don't sell endowment policies. In fact, their mortgages have absolutely no strings attached. But what's really exceptional is that they come with up to seven and a half thousand pounds in cash as a gift. And because CNG mortgages are also available at Lloyd's Bank, they're even easier to get hold of. Ring 0800 333 900 and see how Cheltenham and Gloucester is run to make you richer. There are angels on the streets of Dublin that come down to tempt the likes of me. Did you hurt yourself when you fell from the heavens? Let's stop a short while and have a look at you. Your eyes are a terrible curse to a fellow like myself. And your beautiful hair. It's all gone. Jemison, triple distilled to be the smoothest of the smooth. We've all had problems with grass seed. Not any more with the new Levington range of best quality seeds. They're treated to deter birds and specially selected to give you a beautiful lawn quickly. These tested seeds are treated with a unique Levington fast germination dressing. Choose Levington Evergreen grass seeds for your lawn and see the difference. Remember to check the Comet Price Index in your paper every Saturday because who knows when you might need a new washing machine. Get it right. Come to Comet. Presenting the Dremel Multi. You cut, Dremel cuts. You sharpen, Dremel sharpens. You polish, Dremel polishes. You drill, Dremel drills. You clean, Dremel cleans. You sand, Dremel sands. You grind, Dremel grinds. Uh, did I mention we cut? 
With more than 100 accessories, the Dremel Multi is even more versatile than a Swiss Army knife. I asked him, has he got any change? And he said, uh, yeah. And he went, well, do you want to earn some more? And as far as I thought, well, how? He went, well, come with me and I'll show you. David was first abused by a paedophile when he was just seven. The building was like disused, derelict buildings. All windows smashed. It was just like on its own in the middle of nowhere. There was just a mattress and there was a chair in the corner. He used to take me upstairs. So I make me undress and then he started having all sex with me and then I had to do the same back. So I, he said if he if he could bugger me, he would give me a motorbike. Only if he went so I, all the way. David recalled his abuser also enjoyed pain. On one occasion, he handed him a knife. All he said to me, he said so I pointed to his, so I just under his shoulder by, uh, blade, and said so I put the knife in there. All I'd done is what he told me to do. So I, he said stab him, so I did. The man responsible for the abuse was paedophile Brett Tyler. David's mother remembers the day she found out. He brought back a watch. <laughs> he said a friend give it to him. But he wouldn't tell me who his friend was at first or how he got the watch. And it come out in the end and he's going to be, don't go to the police because he will kill me. He'll come and get me. He's nothing but an evil monster. He really is really evil. I'm sorry, but that bloke should never, ever come out of prison. He should stay there and rot. In 1986, Tyler pleaded guilty to 14 counts of indecency on two children and was jailed for four years. In prison, he forged a relationship with another paedophile, Timothy Morse. During therapy sessions on the sex offender's wing at Wormwood Scrubs, the pair revealed disturbing fantasies about abusing children. On his release in 1989, Morse described one particular obsession to this psychologist who cannot be identified for legal reasons. Morse contacted me himself to, because he was uh, saying that he was in danger of reoffending and he wanted to consult me. He described his fantasies to me then, um, which included the uh, abduction, um, sodomy and killing of a boy of a particular appearance, blonde hair, blue eyed. We know that they repeatedly went out and trawled the East End of London for a suitable child. We know that they in fact stopped children and we believe on one occasion actually took one child into the bushes to abuse a child. But each time that they went out they never saw quite the child that fitted the fantasy. When they found that child, the child was Daniel Handley, they were able to put that fantasy into operation. Daniel was a happy boy. He was very helpful towards people. He was very friendly. If he could do anything for anybody, he'd do it. He was just so full of life. On October the 2nd, 1994, nine-year-old Daniel was out playing on his bike when he was abducted by Morse and Tyler on a busy road near his home in Beckton. The pair drove him to a cab office in Camberwell, where they videoed themselves as they raped him in the flat above. Daniel was then driven along the M4 before being strangled in a lay-by. His body was later buried in Bristol. Daniel's remains were not found until six months later. I took it really bad, and they took me to my doctors. I ended up in a psychiatric hospital for help. I had like a breakdown. I didn't want to believe it, it just affected me so bad. Shortly after Daniel's body was found, an appeal to find his killers went out on BBC TV's Crime Watch. 
And my wife had seen it. I hadn't, but she told me about it the next morning. I asked her, what, what did Daniel look like? And she told me. And it was at that point, I mean, I asked the question uh, because I had um, Morse in mind at the time of asking the question. So when she described him to me, it confirmed, uh, if you like, my fear that he had actually carried out what he said he would. And that was a very chilling moment. Arriving at court under police escort this morning, Brett Tyler, an unemployed man of 30... Dr. B's information helped lead police to Morse and Tyler. I heard that on the radio and it clicked back that that could have been my if I didn't find that sooner. All right. And it got to a stage that I thought to myself, I knew that boy's mother, I would have told her that he's been done before, what Brett Tyler was like. Morse and Tyler were sentenced to three terms of life imprisonment. The judge said they should never be released. Throughout the length of my service, I came in contact with many horrific crimes. I don't feel that I ever came in contact with a crime as cold-blooded as the murder of Daniel Handley. And this includes dealing with uh, murders against hardened criminals, barbaric murders of different kinds. But it was the coldness of Daniel's murder, the clinical decision that he was to die, and the innocence of the child that actually made the, 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 the crime itself all the more detestable and vile. I don't feel nothing for them. I don't even think about them. To me, they're just scum. Who's been let out into the community to reoffend again. They should never have been let out. Neither a police register nor community notification would have prevented Daniel's murder. Morse and Tyler had driven away from their own area and abducted Daniel off the street. Daniel Handley's murder shows that even when paedophiles say they'll kill, the criminal justice system seems powerless to protect children. In many cases, it may even make matters worse. All too often, child sex offenders are locked up with one another, thus reinforcing their deviancy and fueling their fantasies. Many leave prison without treatment or therapy. So if we're going to keep children safe from serial paedophiles, then we need a much more radical approach. One option is more residential treatment centres for sex offenders once they're released. At present, there's only one in the whole of Britain. The only effective way of protecting children is to have effective treatment programmes to work with these men. There will always be a group who will still abuse, and that's the tragedy of this. But for the sake of our victims, they can see that we are trying to reduce the risk. Because it is the failure of our systems that are actually paid for by the future victims. I think that once a person is a paedophile, they're a paedophile for life. It is an affliction that they have got. Now, we can debate whether it's a mental illness or whether they're, they're bad from birth or whether they're crazy. At the bottom line, the problem is that they will always be a danger to children. They're always looking for sex with children. Therefore, I think we have to say that that's a mental aberration at the very least. Once a paedophile has finished his sentence, he's free to go back into the community. Few are categorized as insane, so they can't be committed to mental institutions like Broadmoor. This problem was addressed in the Butler Report in 1975. The report called for new open-ended prison sentences, so offenders could be detained for as long as they were thought a danger to the public. More than 20 years on, nothing has happened. Judges should have the power, before they pass sentence, to call for an assessment risk, to see just how dangerous the person is. If that assessment risk shows that it would be dangerous to release that person into the community in any short period of time, then the judge should have the power to pass an indeterminate sentence so that the case is then reviewed again later to see whether the risk has been reduced. But where we've got people who are a serious risk to the community, it shouldn't be two strikes and you're out, it should be one strike and you're out. Behind me is Belmarsh Prison in Thamesmead. It's here that serial child abuser Mark Weaver is currently serving his sentence. He's the paedophile who's promised to re-offend when released, you'll remember. 
As we've heard, under existing law, there's nothing the authorities can do to keep him in jail. But in this case, there's another shocking twist. We've discovered that like Morse and Tyler, the murderers of Daniel Handley, Weaver is a potential child killer just waiting for a victim. Weaver himself admits he's better off in confinement, yet psychologists say he can't be sectioned because he's not covered by the Mental Health Act. Instead, the authorities have managed to delay his release, but only by a matter of weeks. Yet the report we obtained shows that while in prison, Weaver's fantasies bear haunting echoes of those revealed by the murderers of Daniel Handley. He has fantasies of buggering young boys and having intercourse with little girls. Mark has also said that if he was thwarted by a child, he could then kill if faced with resistance by his victim. We showed a copy of the report to Michelle Elliott. When you look at the background of the, of the men who killed Daniel Hanley, they had fantasies, they had convictions, they got together and their fantasies became ever more violent and they decided they were going to go out and kill, abduct and kill and sexually abuse a boy and that's exactly what they did. When you look at people like Weaver, you have the same sort of pattern and you know that ultimately that is what he is going to do. He's telling us that is what he is going to do. And yet we still have a system in which we allow these people out knowing what they're going to do. And we know from the patterns of all of these pedophiles that they will just get more and more nasty and violent until a child is killed. And we're willing to sit back and let it happen. And it just makes you want to weep. I think he's really sick in Ed. He is really sick. They shouldn't release him. They should not let him out. They should just give him a, a lethal injection. He doesn't deserve to be let out of prison. I'm just so scared of him getting hold of any other child. In a situation where a prisoner has actually said he may kill a child, um, should he still be released when his sentence is finished? We, we, would have we don't have enormous powers to actually detain somebody on the basis of something that they have said. Um, clearly, we do have, in, in cases of life imprisonment, if someone has committed a serious sexual offence and they've been subject to life imprisonment, then of course we do have latitude in that respect. Uh, but uh, not just for saying something, I regret. In two months' time, Mark Weaver will walk free from prison. While no lessons are learnt from the past, children will continue to pay the ultimate price. I've been going from day to day, just carrying on from day to day doing my daily chores. I had my good days, I had my bad days, which is natural. It's going to take a hell of a long while to get over. I'm now coming to terms. I'm not going to see Daniel. I know where Daniel is, he's at rest. And I know nobody else can hurt him. I know that he's safe.